Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joanna Cohn, Director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to our monthly Innovations in Tobacco Control Seminar Series. I'm especially happy to introduce to you today my colleague, Dr. Kevin Welding. Um, Kevin has been here at the School of Public Health for five years now. Couldn't believe it, how quick, how time flies. Um, before he came here as our, our um, senior biostatistician, um, Kevin was getting all of his training in economics. So his PhD is in economics from the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he did his dissertation on economic approaches related to substance use prevention. So just perfect for um, what we're doing at the Institute for Global Tobacco Control. And his previous degrees were in economics as well. So he came clearly well trained and it's been, um, you know, he's exceeded my expectations for sure. It's been terrific working with him. And, and in addition to the work that Kevin will be talking to you about today, he's been involved in many global discussions around tobacco taxes and illicit trade and has, is um, a real um, global expert on these issues. So I'm just really pleased to have Dr. Welding here to talk to us today about the market for tobacco products in India, which is fascinating. But I won't um, take any of the, I'll, I'll leave it all to you to, to uh, give all the punchlines. So thank you for being here, Kevin. So I wasn't nervous until that introduction. Now, now I'm a little nervous. Um, I have to live up to that. Uh, so yeah, thank, thanks for having me. Um, so I, I, I do, it's, it's weird to give a talk here in, at Hopkins and here in the US, I, I, I work here. And I was thinking like, you know, most of the time I've traveled somewhere very far, I'm sleeping in a hotel room, so I have excuses if this goes you know, poorly when I'm in another country, I can always blame it on jet lag. Here I can't do that. Um, so I always start a lot of my talks with a little bit of a, a, a two PSAs. Uh, one is about economists. So economists get sort of dumped into one bucket. Everyone's like, oh, I met an economist. You're like, okay, it's, it's sort of the same thing. You met a doctor, like what type of doctor, right? You would probably want to see a certain type of doctor for a certain type of thing. Economics is not that different. So we do have a lot of different types of economists. I'm an applied microeconomist. So basically it's a, it's a quantitative social scientist in a way. You give me a question, you give me some data, and I'll try to give you an answer with that data. Um, and so keep that in mind. The other one is that it's not all about money for economists. Uh, really, it's the science of decision making, of choice, of scarcity. So you can use that in a lot of different ways. And economists do use that around time because that's one of our scarce resources, but also around money. And so I, I say that, but I will talk a little bit about prices throughout this talk. Um, let me see. I think the clicker should work. Uh, yeah. So okay, here's my outline. We'll go over background, and it'll be a background of sort of how we got here, India, how we're doing tobacco control research, some of the prior research that the Institute has done in this area, and then the current study we're working on, and then what to expect moving forward. Um, so okay, some background around India. India is a big country. So the population, 1.3 billion. Um, and they do have a tobacco control issue. And actually, it's a little bit different than a lot of countries because it's not around the smoked form, right? There's about 10.7% of the adult population using smoked tobacco, a much bigger percentage using smoke list tobacco, 21.4%. And so you'll see, I'll focus on both of those things. And, and we'll talk about BDs and we'll talk about smokeless tobacco. Also, to put this in context, it's the second leading consumer, third largest producer, and the fifth largest exporter of tobacco products globally, okay? So this is intertwined with this country. Um, and they estimated over a million people, one point, over 1.1 million people, die in India each year from diseases caused by tobacco use. And when I think of these numbers, these big numbers, I always go and try to find a, a U.S. city to, to equate to this. And the one I found was actually San Jose is about the same size of this. So San Jose would be out, no population in San Jose after a year, right? So it might be surprising for some that San Jose is that big, but it is as well. Um, okay, so some quick definitions for people who might not know. Um, and again, these are loose definitions. So cigarettes, we're gonna talk about cigarettes and I'm gonna think of this as like a, a comparative good um, or bad. So they're finely cut tobacco rolled in paper, right? This is probably the product that most people are familiar with. 
Um, the other ones that we'll talk about are BDs and smokeless. So BDs is a cheap version of a cigarette, mostly hand rolled. I think the numbers I've seen about 98% of them are hand rolled. Some are machine rolled. Um, they're unprocessed tobacco and generally. Sometimes you also do get some processed tobacco and they're typically wrapped in tendu leaves instead of paper, okay? Smokeless tobacco, this is a very broad definition. It's tobacco that is chewed or snuffed instead of smoked. And actually there's a bunch of different types of smokeless tobacco and you'll see as I talk, that's one of the complications um, about actually working in smokeless tobacco, all the different types that you'll have to encounter. Okay, so again, a little bit more context, specifically why we care about BDs and smokeless. So BDs and smokeless tobacco account for over 80% of tobacco consumption in India. So again, 200 million Indians use smokeless tobacco products and over 70 million use BDs. BDs are the most common form of smoked tobacco. And I've actually seen that 81% number even higher, that like 90% covers uh, just BDs and smokeless and only 10% on cigarettes. Um, and you'll see that we're thinking about rural and semi-urban areas in this study, and the reason is that these products, BDs and smokers, are particularly pop popular outside of urban areas among poor and less educated consumers. And you'll also see that there's a lot of people living in these areas in India. Okay, so that's my India background. Now a little bit about how sort of Hopkins fits into this scenario. We're one of the partners in the Bloomberg Initiative to reduce tobacco use. That's kind of why we're here sitting in this room. Here are some of the other partner organizations and we fit in as an academic partner along with uh, UIC. You can see we have some other big agencies, sort of international agencies like WHO and CDC, which does our sort of GATS and GYTS data collection. Um, and we have other ones like CTFK and the Union of Vital Strategies that really work very closely with a bunch of in-country partners. Um, lately, we've also been working with the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, uh, but so they're not up there, but they exist. Um, okay, so specifically where the data comes from that I'm going to talk about is our TPACS project, the Tobacco Pack Surveillance System. And this system is actually built for us to do one thing among many other things, and that first thing is to look at health warning label compliance. So we go to these countries, we try to buy one of every pack, and we look to see whether health warning labels are actually compliant with their laws. This is a little bit different approach than someone like the WHO might say is just, you know, is the law in place or not? We take a different approach where we say, are they actually fulfilling their obligations to that law? And sometimes, and oftentimes, we see that they're not. And we'll talk about that along the way. So we've done this in 14 countries, I think sort of officially, um, and we've gone back to nine, and India we've done three times, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So we typically go to three cities in a country. Usually it's the most populous city. The other two, I think, are from the top 10 populous cities. We sort of spread across that city in different SES neighborhoods, and then we look at different vendor types, and we're trying to cast a very wide net so that we get one of every tobacco product, okay? One of every unique tobacco product. So our goal here is very different than sort of getting a sense of what the, the market is. We're really trying to get how broad the market is, okay? So keep that in mind. This is a slide that I think is a little bit ambitious to explain our walking protocol in one slide, but let's see if we can do this. Again, the goal is to purchase unique tobacco packs. Um, so we started a pre-selected hub in our first neighborhood. We walk towards commercial activity. We look for vendor type number one, which is the most popular vendor type in that country. And if we find that, that's great. We make a purchase there. If not, we continue for 15 minutes. And then we, if we don't find anything of that vendor type, we switch to another vendor type. And as we move through neighborhoods, we sort of alternate vendor types so that we're sort of casting this wide net. Um, and so hopefully that kind of makes sense. I can assure you that we do a very good job of casting a very wide net. When we go back into these countries, we find sort of consistent results, which is uh, fairly interesting. These are some of our in-country partners, which we could not do this work without. Um, these are actually people taking pictures of the packs, uh, looking to see, and you can imagine that going into the first store to make a unique purchase pack is, A, you're making that person's career or their, their year. You're buying one of everything in their store. In a lot of these countries, that, that's a big impact. But as you go through the next stores, you can imagine that it's sort of difficult to make sure you're only getting the unique pack. So it, it is really these people's hard work that makes this happen. 
And then once we have all these packs, they end up on this repository that is our TPAX page where we have everything that we've collected across from these 14 countries. Um, and I'll give you one glimpse of what one of the pack pages looks like. So this is one smokeless product. You get information like the country, the city, when we purchased this and the price, and some information about whether this was non-compliant, uh, a non-compliant health warning label. And in this case, it was, and it was non-compliant on three different measures. Okay, so now let me talk about our prior research. So what we've actually done in India, specifically around what I'm talking about. We've also done some sort of smoke-free and, and designated smoking room uh, work, but I'll stick with what TPAX has done in India. And we've had three waves of data collection in India, and actually it was the first country where we had a third wave, and I believe Brazil, which is right happening right now, is, a third, is our second country with a third wave of data collection. So in the first one, we went to three cities, and we collected just cigarettes and beaties. In the second collection, three years later, and they had changed their law, so we went back to take a look, we added one more city, and we also collected smokeless tobacco. And in the last one, we went to different areas. We didn't go to cities, we went to semi-urban and rural areas in five states. And in this study, we actually considered the state as like its own country, kind of, and we tried to find the unique packs in each one of those states. And again, we collected cigarettes, beaties, and smokeless. So really quickly, I'll show you what we've done with that information. So in 2013, data collection, the cigarettes, the first thing we do is look at health warning label compliance. We look at the law and we look at whether the packs, the health warning labels on those packs are compliant with that law. So in 2013, the law was not particularly strong. It just needed a 40% graphic health warning label on the front of the pack. And you see 80% of the packs, which I think I have a pointer, maybe, huh? I don't know if I want to go do a Vanna White thing, but 80% of the packs were compliant, right? That's good, that's not great. You'd imagine 100% should be compliant in all of these things, but we don't find that. And you can see that it was the warning size that really made these things non-compliant. So we don't just do health warning label compliance when we get these things. Any good researcher, if you have some data, you should do as many things as you can with that data, really stretch the sort of efficiency of your money. So we look at other areas of these packs, right? We have this big collection, and one of the things we noticed here was the printing quality of the warning labels was an issue in India. And so we're seeing this right now for cigarettes, and I'm going to talk about BDs and smokeless as well. If this is happening in cigarettes, we almost certainly know it's going to be happening in BDs and smokeless, the way they sort of frame the industry. So you can see the reference image, and you can see the images on the packs. They're not as sharp as the reference image, okay? So we keep this in our mind. We present this information that this is something that civil society, the government should be keeping an eye on in India. We also have an opportunity to look at the inventory of packs when we make these purchases. So we get to say whether the packs had the right health warning label on it, did they have an old health warning label on it, or did they have no or a foreign health warning label on it. So you get an idea of whether there's some illicit packs on the market and whether some packs are sitting on the shelves that should have been removed when a new health warning label came into place. Okay, so you see about 56% of packs in this first collection had the appropriate health warning label on it. That means still a sizable amount did not. And here you'll see about 30% had no health warning label or a foreign health warning label. So you have this idea that they came from another country. Okay, so fast forward to 2016. And again, just looking at cigarettes, the law has gotten much better. Um, the graphic health warning label is 85% of the front and back of the panel. Now, you'll see that the compliance has gone much further down. We had 80%, now we have 51%. This is something that we're very cognizant about. We, we think, you know, if you have a very good law, sometimes it might be hard to be compliant with a good law. So being compliant with a law might not be the best thing in the world, right? If your law is very poor, very easy to be compliant with, you might have 95% compliant with a bad law. So it's something we do keep in mind. And again, here you'll see that the thing that was really driving the non-compliance was that warning label size, okay? And as I said before, we keep this in mind when we have this pack collection, we look at what are other areas that we might be concerned about. And in this sample, it was beveled edges on a pack. So this is instead of a 90 degree edge, like the middle pack, we introduced, or they introduced, the industry introduces either a rounded edge or a nice flattened edge 
which allows them to bring some branding up to the front of the pack again. Okay, so this is something, again, to keep in mind, sort of defining what the front panel of a PAC is. It's something that we think legislators might not have been thinking when they put these laws in place, and we might like to make people aware of that. Again, we see what the inventory is like on these shelves. So in this case, a little bit better, 58% were actually had the appropriate current health warning label when we made the purchase. Um, but it's still a sizable amount that did not have the correct health warning label. So this gives us a sense of the illicit market or just the slow to move, I guess, inventory off the shelves or slow to actually return old inventory when they make these changes. In a lot of countries, that is mandated. Um, so, okay, now let's look, at, let's look at smokeless tobacco in 2016. You'll notice the compliance is much lower. It's 2%. I'm not going to go into too many details about our smoke list because we'll talk about it throughout the rest of the presentation. But again, the driver is the warning size and especially the, the text size. Um, and one of the issues is actually sort of laid out here on the bottom of this slide. Smokeless tobacco comes in all shapes and sizes, and even the industry tries to say, well, we can't even fit 85% on our really small packaging, which is, I mean, impossible, because if the package is the size it is, you could fit any percentage on it. Um, so some of our work was whether this was even feasible. Um, and I'll, this is where, not, where smokeless gets a little tricky, too, later in my talk, where I'm saying there's a lot of different types of smokeless, there's a lot of different sizes, of these products as well. So I'll sort of try to present this in a very clear way. The other thing, the, the printing quality was even sort of worse than uh, cigarettes, as you can see. Some of these you can't see anything. Now I'm gonna skip forward to the sample that I'm going to talk about without giving you too many details about that sample because I will talk about it in more detail in a second. But we've already done some stuff with this 2017, what I call the rural sample. It's really semi-urban and rural areas, and actually it's anything less than, I believe, 50,000 people uh, would fall into this sample. So we've already looked at BD health warning compliance, and it was zero. None of the packs that we found were compliant with the law. Um, and particularly, there are two issues. One, again, is the image distortion and the poor printing quality. I'm not going to show you an example of that, because we've already seen two examples of that, that the printing quality is poor. Um, the other thing is the health warning label location and wrapped packaging. One of the things mandated in the law is that the health warning labels essentially have to be diametrically opposite of each other. That's very easy on a cigarette pack or on a little packet that is smokeless, right? It's on the front, it's on the back. That's diametrically opposite. It's a little bit more diffi difficult on BDs. BDs typically come in two packaging varieties. It's over here on the right side. There's two different versions. The left one is it's almost like a little sachet plastic Ziploc bag type thing, which does have a nice sort of front and back. The other one, which is much more popular, is this paper wrapping around that sort of ends up looking like a cone because of the shape of the beady. Um, and you can imagine we have like one of the wrappings laid out here on the left image. It's gonna be difficult to do two things. It's gonna be difficult to get those things diametrically opposite, the two warnings, and it's also going to be difficult to make them not be obstructed with the rest of the wrapping. And you see an example here of that the wrapping is obstructing the health warning label. So the packaging is causing a, a lot of the problems here. One of the other things we've done is with our smokeless sample, we've also seen some what we, I guess we can say it's intentional manipulation. Um, and I say we can say it's intentional manipulation because A is our reference images. You can see the cancer very well. B and C are where it's a little more blurry. C, we think of the entire image as blurred. And B, we even think of just the cancer area as blurred out, which gives us some indication that this is more intentional. If the entire image is blurred, they could say, oh, this is a production quality thing. We can't do anything about it. If you're just seeing parts of the image blurred and the part of the image that you would particularly like consumers to see blurred, you can start to think that there is intent there. So this is something that we've already put out. Okay, so now let me talk about what I'm here to talk about. Um, so hopefully that sets the stage very well. We're gonna talk about this 2017 sample that was in rural and semi-urban areas. And again, that's less than 50,000 people in these towns or areas. Um, and we went to five states, and I'll show you a map in a second. Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Assam, Rajasthan, and Karnataka. 
Um, and we've collected BDs, smokeless, and cigarettes. So we've collected all three tobacco products that are fairly prominent. Um, and my objective here is to examine the brand variability, um, and I'll, you'll see how I do that, and the price, and the presence of an Indian health warning label, because I really want to say something about whether the market is really moving these products off the shelves when they should be, and whether there are illicit markets in place. Um, and I say I do this for BDs and smokeless, but I will do this for cigarettes as well, because I really do think that most people are more familiar with the cigarette market, and more familiar with the tobacco, big tobacco that they think really is, is sort of a cigarette companies. So we'll use that as a reference. Um, so here are where the five states that we're going to talk about. And when I briefly sort of laid out what TPAX does, we go into a country and we try to get one of everything in a country. In this study, we tried to get one of everything in each of these states. So we treated these states like their own countries just to get a sample to see if it's different across the country. And you'll see, I can go back. For those unfamiliar with BDs, there's an example of what a BD looks like in the upper left. It is the cone packaging. And again, the, the BD cigarette does look sort of cone-ish too. That's why it ends up having that same shape. It's usually wrapped in a nice little colorful string. That one particularly, that is not a particularly colorful string holding it together, but that's an example and a smokeless example as well. A lot of times when I talk about smokeless, I'll sort of, throughout this, I'll isolate chewing tobacco and, and remove sort of like oral and uh, nasal and tobacco paste and all these other types of things just to make it a little bit cleaner for this presentation. So why rural India? Um, this is from the 2011 census. They'll have a new census out relatively soon. So the population is a little bit dated here. You can see it's 1.2 billion. So I've already taken 100 million people away from India from the beginning of the lecture to this point. Uh, but the point of this one is to see that a lot of them are in rural areas already. So this is why we have a particular sort of paying attention to the rural areas. The prevalence of the use of these products is also higher in rural areas. So now I want to overlay the five states that we actually did this work in. It's a pretty sizable population just in rural areas of these five states, right? It's about the size of the U.S. population, roughly. Um, okay. So again, I like to frame everything around cigarettes because it's the thing I think most people are familiar with. So cigarettes in India does paint a sort of normal picture of what most countries look like. It's dominated by a small number of companies and a small number of brands. ITC Limited is the, I mean, in a sense, it's the Philip Morris of India. It's sort of weird to kind of say that, um, but they have a, a very big market of, that, of, the, of the country. And uh, another thing that's very sort of tricky in India is that they stretch their brand. They do a lot more than just tobacco ITC. So you'll see ITC stuff over all sorts of things in India, but I won't get too much into that. Um, and again, about seven brands account for 80% of the market of cigarettes, okay? It's essentially the opposite for the other products, or they want you to uh, make, it, make it appear to be the opposite for these other products. So there's no really one big company doing smokeless tobacco. We actually, a lot of these numbers are coming from Euromonitor, which is industry reported, so take them with a grain of salt. But we do see this sort of opposite, like 61% of smokeless tobacco is coming from sort of smaller producers, right? They don't have a big market share. And BDs, we seemingly know even less about that. It's structured around a lot of small local producers. And I'll talk briefly about why the tax structure in India sort of has made this be beneficial, okay? And I mean, sort of, this, there's this other sort of overlying thing where, where there's a lot of women and child labor in the BD industry because they want to have these small producers and, you know, in some instance, having a lot of women involved in that would be a good thing. But in this case, they're pretty low down the, uh, the pecking order and it's not necessarily a good thing. And obviously, child labor is never a good thing. Um, okay. So now let's talk about a little bit what we were able to do with the data that we had. It wasn't perfectly ideal for a lot of these questions, but we tried to use sort of what we had to say what we can. So the product breakdown, I have 71 BDs, 240 smokeless tobacco products, and 71 cigarette packs. The first thing I did was look at the number of brands for each one of those products. So for BDs, there was 55 brands. 
for, and these are brand families, so it's a higher level. It's not a brand variant that you might be familiar with, like a Marlboro Red, it's just Marlboro, something like that. So 55 BD brands, 97 smokeless tobacco brands, and 29 cigarette brands. And what you see on the right side is basically the number of brands divided by the number of products we purchase. So it gives you an idea of that, sort of the concentration of that market. And BD's appears to be sort of spread out. It's almost 80% of the brands account for that percentage of the number of products we bought. Smokeless tobacco and cigarettes look a little more similar to each other, okay? And I think the, the nice piece of evidence on the bottom is that interstate brand. So this is the number of brands that we found in more than one state. And what you see is that the BD brands, there's only three of them that appear in more than one state. That's 5% of the number of brands that we found. So they appear to be very localized um, in a sense. Yeah, it's, it's weird for me because like, I want to say, oh, they, don't, they appear not to be very international because I'm thinking of each one of these states as a separate country, but they appear not to be across most of India. Um, smokeless tobacco, you have a little bit more that you're finding in multiple states. And cigarettes, although it's a smaller number than smokeless tobacco, in percentage terms, it's accounting for more of the brands. 41% of the brands were in more than one state, where smokeless tobacco, only 20% of the brands were in more than one state. Okay, so again, you get this idea that cigarettes are sort of more again, international or global in India, and that the BDs are a little more localized and smoke smokeless tobacco is somewhere in between. Okay, so as an economist, I have to talk about prices, so here it is, don't leave the room. Um, so I'll start with BDs. So this is, a, again, this is a pack of BDs or the cone of BDs. Uh, the median price is about 12 rupees here. You see a very small range of prices between five and 25. That's what the little bar graph is also displaying. For smokeless tobacco, this tends to be a packet. Sometimes it's a little tin, and I'll talk about this on the next slide. The median price is about five rupees. And if you're trying to do the, the conversion down at the bottom, I have a note that 65 rupees at that time was about $1. I'll do the conversion for you in the next slide as well. Um, but you see a pretty big range. And this is probably indicative that I'm getting packets that are 0.3 grams all the way to cylinders that have a lot more smokeless tobacco in them. On the other side, there's the similar range of cigarettes, but that's for a different reason. Most of the cigarette packs have about the same number of sticks. This is because they want to have sort of economy and premium brands across that thing. And you see a much higher median price of about 95 rupees. So I said I would do the math for you. And here, each of the first line of each one of these bullets is me converting those rupees into dollars. But I have to do something else here because it's not really fair to compare a pack of BDs, a pack of cigarettes, and whatever that packet of smokeless is. So I did a couple things here. For BDs and cigarettes, I'm gonna give you the per stick cost, right? And then we can think about what that, whether consumption is the same as one stick to another stick, that's a different question. Um, and for smokeless, I'll say what the price is per gram. And again, I tried to find like the, the gram equivalent to smoking one cigarette and I found some rather old data from uh, a researcher that said like roughly six grams, but that can't be true about all different types of smokeless tobacco because we're purchasing stuff that comes in a single serving of 0.3 grams. So I tried not to convert it back up to six grams. And actually, if I were to have a bar graph of these things, I can assure you it actually looks just like this. Um, the price of BD, the median price of BDs and smokeless by gram or stick is about the same. And that variance between smokeless tobacco and cigarettes is similar with cigarettes having a much higher median price. I don't know if you want to double check, but around the same price of BDs and smokeless per gram and per stick, the range of BDs is much smaller. And again, the range of the smokeless per gram is close to the range for uh, a single stick of cigarettes, while that single stick of cigarette is a bit more expensive. So it does, even though I've converted it into sort of similar units or at least made some conversion and some effort to make them comparable, you do get a similar picture as you did in the last slide. Okay, so obviously I'm gonna do a little bit more with the price. Some we have this information that there's printed prices on these packs and then we know what we paid for them. So I broke this out into BDs and actually I didn't make a mention of this. Overlying all of this, or maybe underlying all of this, we have this issue of Gutka in India. 
where they've been gutka, where it's already pre-mixed between tobacco and spices, and now they sort of sell them separately, but at the same stall, and you can sort of mix it on your own, right? So we have all of these quote unquote, what we're calling them twin packs, and I think a lot of people call them twin packs. And for comparing the prices, it's sort of tricky to know. I, I'm, I'm still using just the price printed on the smokeless tobacco versus what we actually paid. And the real question is, did we pay for that spice mixture or was it just thrown in for free? Um, and if I look at this data on that second line, I've overpaid for all of the smokeless tobacco that is a twin pack. So I'm pretty sure I'm paying for that spice mixture at the same time. So it's, that's a good thing to, to sort of take away from this slide. The other thing is that BDs don't print their prices on their packaging. That's another thing to take away from this slide. The smokeless tobacco single packs and cigarettes, they look fairly similar of whether you're overpaying, underpaying, or paying that printed price. And uh, it's a different conversation of why you would underpay or overpay. Um, but it's pretty similar between cigarettes and the single pack smoke list. You're overpaying a little bit more for, for cigarettes in this setting. Okay. So I also look at health warning labels, but I look at health warning labels for sort of a different reason other than compliance. I'm looking to see you know, what country are they from? Are they currently the health warning label? Are they the old health warning label? Or are they not an Indian health warning label whatsoever? Because it can give me an idea of how quickly those products are moving off the shelf, whether they are being removed from the shelves. And again, we're thinking of rural India or semi-urban areas in India. So are they actually going and removing the old products when a new legislation comes in place? So for BDs, everything had an Indian health warning label on it. 45% had an up-to-date one, which means 55% had an older one. So you can imagine that the stock was sort of sitting on the shelf and wasn't being removed. For smokeless tobacco, you actually see something fairly similar. Um, almost all of them, 98% had an Indian health warning label. So four packs essentially were illicit that we were able to purchase. And so 55% had the current one and 43% had an older one. So again, you have this feeling that the, the product is sitting on the shelf and is not being removed when it should be removed. And then for cigarettes, you get a little bit more illicit. I think in this case, it's about 10% that didn't have an Indian health warning label on it, but you get much more that are actually have the correct health warning label on it. So they, they are removing from the shelves or they're sort of moving off the shelves quicker than BDs are smokeless. Um, and the thing to take away from here is this is probably pretty logical. This makes BDs and smokeless look a little bit more like a local industry, right? Where you can imagine getting a lot of international cigarettes into India, but you probably couldn't imagine getting a lot of internationally made BDs or smokeless into India when you produce so much of it on your own. So that could be one sort of flavor that you figure out from this. The other thing, and I, I I didn't know whether to include this slide, and I frantically emailed a friend of the WHO last night to confirm that I could kind of include this slide and that I was thinking about the new taxation law, and luckily, because Geneva is at a different time zone, I had the email response when I woke up, so I feel a little bit more confident about this. So most of the packaging has, or it's supposed to have, inclusive of all taxes. It's supposed to say that it paid all of its taxes, and the BDs, you can see, none of them had this. Smokeless tobacco, much less. Cigarettes had this, uh, like at least in the current packs. And I sort of differentiated between the current health warning label, which should be compliant with current laws, to older health warning labels, which might not be compliant with current laws. And I don't expect to have Indian taxes paid on any of the foreign health warning or foreign health warning label packs. So that's not shocking to me. But you can imagine that this is probably some sort of tax evasion. And it, in a sense it might be, but it's sort of state confirmed or state approved because there's an exemption for a lot of these companies on the GST for small businesses. If you're not, I think, doing production of 2 million rupees, you don't have to pay the tax. So there is an incentive for the BD industry and actually for any industry to appear to be a lot of small producers that probably have one or a few major companies over these very small producers. But there is this incentive to be a small producer to evade these taxes, okay? And you're seeing that in BDs, you're not seeing that in cigarettes because it probably would be very hard to sort of break down these big cigarette companies to make them appear as magically as small uh, cigarette companies right now. 
But with BDs, when these things are actually made in somebody's home at somebody's kitchen table, it's much easier to, to imagine this as a, as a small uh, business. So we do see that in the data. So, okay, this is not the conclusion of my talk, but this is the conclusion of this study slides. Um, so what did we learn? The price and brand distribution across smokeless products looks similar to cigarettes. But the observed pricing and the brand variability of BDs provides the appearance of many small producers. Whether that's true or not, I cannot say. Um, and I think it might be a poorly kept secret that it's not true. Um, so we have very few BDs and smokeless tobacco products were found without an Indian health warning label. And I do think this is indicative of either localized production or localized distribution. And the next steps for me in this study is to look at, compare the states against each other and to also look at the urban, which we have from 2016, to this more rural sample that we have in 2017. Um, and I think there are other things that I can promise I should do, but let's just leave it at that. Uh, okay, the last thing, moving forward. So what do we do from here? So I let this slide linger, only uh, not to just to get a drink of water, but to say that these are the questions I think that still remain is the BD industry, and hopefully this study can, can contribute something to these questions. Is the BD industry really different than the smokeless and cigarette industries? And how do we improve the compliance on smokeless tobacco and BD packaging? And how do we address the affordability of smokeless tobacco and BD products, which I did not sort of stress too much, but we see they're a much cheaper product. You don't have to answer those questions. I actually tried to answer them for you. Uh, we can treat the BD and smokeless tobacco industries similar to the tobacco industry involved in cigarettes. We can remove special treatment for small businesses for all tobacco products. And we can consider standard packaging for BDs and smokeless tobacco that can address health warning label issues and also have an impact on affordability. Um, and I, I, I think I, I can't really go through talking about India without talking about the faces that we see on BD packaging. And this does tie into what I'm talking about because this is another way that I believe they, they make it look like a small business. There's a lot of pride that appears to be in making BDs, which I cannot fathom and cannot imagine a tobacco company having a lot of pride in their product, pride enough to put their face on their product. So someone in their family, typically their face or often their face is on the BD packaging. So I think colleagues of mine who I'll thank in a little bit uh, are also working on this sort of phenomenon that there is this, this pride in making BDs. So we will continue to support our partners working in India. And I, I say we will, moving forward, we will provide evidence for court cases. And this is actually something for the feasibility of health warning labels and BD taxation that we've already had to do. And I imagine we'll have to do it again. Um, and we will keep an eye on the e-cigarette ban, which literally just happened which will probably be in litigation for a while, and we will keep an eye on unintended consequences of said ban. One thing I also want to mention is that, so we have this repository that's our tobacco pack surveillance system, but we also have what we call share a pack, which is a little more faster moving, you know, in-country partners can see something, take a picture of it, and post it almost immediately onto our site. And this is actually how we got tipped off on this package of BDs, which had Lionel Messi the, Bar the Barcelona and Argentina soccer star on this package of BDs. Um, we tried to reach out to his representatives to say, hey, did you know that you were uh, in a BD industry? Um, neither he nor his team, either club or country, got back to us. We, we did write a little blog post about this in Tobacco Control. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good that we have this share pack to get sort of fast moving uh, feelings of the industry. So uh, last or second to last slide, uh, I have to thank obviously the TPAX team and all of my IGTC family, who is many of them are here now, and actually even some of my Bloomberg partner family who is also here, um, but particularly the PIs, Joanna and Kate. Kate, who's, I, I don't want to put this on her, who's going to do that face research. Uh, now I feel like she has to because it's, you know, here in posterity. Um, but Mike and Sajal as well, this, this stuff can't be done without you and our collaborators in, in India at Helis, Prakash and, and Namrata have been very good. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me.
Yeah, go ahead. Two questions about two questions about enforcement. First, what's the official enforcement system look like? And second, do you ever hear of beat cops shaking people down if they have a foreign or no warning label thing in their stall? I don't know that, I mean, so I think there's issues with, sometimes there's issues with implementing these things in the first place. Like, I mean, getting to enforcement would actually almost be good. Um, sometimes these laws aren't even implemented fully. Um, so actually, I don't know too much about the details of how, how extensive the enforcement is with some of this stuff. I have not heard stories of people shaking down people with foreign illicit packs in their, in their uh, stores. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. I mean, we have a, a few people in here that, that do a ton of other India research. You've seen that in Bangladesh. Yeah. Like advertising of products where police come in and... Yeah, and yeah. I think I've, Bangladesh I've seen in the uh, Philippines as well, where they'll be very, I don't know what the word is, exuberant in their enforcement to, a, to an extreme. Uh, but no, I haven't had examples in India of, of this. Kevin, can you talk a little bit more about the dimensions of the illicit products? You had some great slides that sort of showed that there weren't a lot that you identified. Um, in different markets around the world, people <clears throat> would buy cigarettes that maybe were made and produced in other places of the world. Um, can you talk about how you determine whether or not a pack is illicit and what that means from a... Um, yeah. So I'll say two things. Actually, I'd probably say a few things. Um, so I do a lot of illicit trade work. I think Joanna said that when she introduced me. Um, the, this data collection isn't amazing to really figure out what the illicit market looks like, A, because it tends to be a research team going in and sort of very obviously buying a bunch of cigarettes, so they're probably not you know, just handing over all of the illicit packs. We tend to have a couple of other methods, actually a few different methods, to get a good number on the illicit market, which would be some of the discarded pack collection stuff, smoker survey interviews, it's particularly nice when a country has a list of sort of legal brands. It's also nice when there's a minimum price that you know products can't be sold under and you can get that price from people to figure out. In smoker surveys, they're not also going to be like, yeah, I smoke illicit cigarettes or something like that as well. So you have to be a little bit crafty about how you figure that out. Um, and then you also have some gap analysis stuff where it's sort of how much do you produce, how much do you consume, how much do you export, that number, that gap in there is the illicit number. Um, typically we identify it just by not having the country's health warning label on it or not having a tax stamp. Usually those two things are highly correlated with each other. So actually in a lot of the studies it's tricky to use the tax stamp because the tax stamp is intentionally crafted to be broken when you open the pack so that you can't reuse the tax stamp. Um, so often the tax stamps just fall off. And I mean, you have researchers saying, well, is there glue residue that made it look like there was a tax stamp there? So a lot of times we are just using whether the health warning label is, is correct on the pack to identify illicit. And I will say there's a lot of other illicit activity that this does not capture. A lot of countries have single stick sale issues, which is illicit, but it's not a problem that we can identify from just looking at the pack. And I think India is one of those countries where they're selling single stick cigarettes as well. I think some, some colleagues as well have gone to collect used packs from single stick sellers at the end of the day to see if they are illegal packs or illicit as well. Yeah. When you talk about uh, products moving off the shelves, especially in the rural areas, is there a buyback program or a way for sellers to add the current label to the old products? That's a really good question. I'm actually not sure if there's a buyback problem. I, I, I believe there should be, right? I don't think, I, I always feel bad. I don't know, I shouldn't feel bad for the <laughs> retailer a lot, but sometimes you do feel bad for the retailer. <laughs> like it's, it's like feeling bad for tobacco farmers too. Like a lot of times they're sort of stuck doing this and that the industry is sort of over top of them and I, I don't want to use the idea of like indentured servitude but it does have that feeling so I, I feel sort of bad for these retailers who might be selling just a little bit of it and if this legislation passes and it's a better legislation that they're sort of stuck with these packs there should be a buyback program there should be this should be on the industry to actually bear the sort of losses from this I, I really believe that um, 
Now, that, again, I actually am not 100% sure whether there is a buyback program. I would doubt there's a buyback program. Can people put a new label, like sticker on a pack? So we have seen that, actually. Um, and I, in my mind, that is sort of a, a legal approach, right? It, it might not be letter of the law in some countries, where you know most of the packs will have cellophane over it. You see a slap, a sticker slap on that cellophane. That is the the most. That's fine. That that's getting the message across. At least that initial impact. You know, health warning labels have sort of two things that they do, right? One is that they're essentially an advertisement all the time for anyone who just sees them. But then there's a different effect for the smoker who picks up the pack every time. So I can imagine that. So the letter of the law, that might not be legal to have a sticker on the cellophane because once you remove that cellophane, it goes back to the old health warning label and they get that daily or every cigarette reminder of an older, maybe less effective health warning label. But I mean, for me, a sticker of the new health warning label would be better than not. Joe, yeah. the next question. Can sure. you just turn the button on your microphone? Oh, no. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Do we have to do, I have to do all those questions no. again? <laughs> Should I? Or I can just go over here? Okay, yeah. Sorry. Those were all really good responses, just by the way. If, if, yeah, if people on the, the, the YouTube could not hear that, I nailed all of those. Go ahead. Thank you for that. <laughs> all right, good, good, good. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I'd be curious to get a little bit more of your take on the B market, because I think what you alluded to is that yeah. it's so highly localized. But I think you also hinted that there might be like sort of bigger corporations sort of moving in the background. And yeah. I wonder if there's like any indication in the data you're collecting from the packs or like, you know, other sorts of data that, that, that can give us more information. So one thing I like, while I'm doing this, I thought about this. Let me see if I can go back to this slide. Like, where was it? So one thing I could do, I was thinking about this literally the other night while I was working on this, is to, to look at the number of brands that we see of BDs across these three samples, whether that number of brands is increasing over time as, I mean, the tax incentives have sort of always been there, so that would be tough, but I mean, it's hard to imagine that these, these small producers or these families, like unless, like I feel like they'd be making more money out of this deal if there wasn't someone over top of them essentially taking the profits. And I think we have other evidence from other partner organizations of sort of qualitative stuff of talking to these people, of saying, you know, that that these these middlemen, which I mean, obviously, if there's a middleman, there's someone on the top, these middlemen coming and saying, you know, some of these BDs aren't even good enough for us to purchase. Like, so they make all of these BDs and only like the good ones get purchased. They say, oh, I'm not going to even buy these other poorly rolled BD, the other BDs, um, but they still end up taking those BDs for free essentially and using them. So there, there's too many, I think, there's too much evidence that it's not uh, some large similar like conglomeration. Like, I, I don't think there's essentially like one company, a monopoly, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if it is something more like an oligopoly where you have a few big uh, companies that are, that are really umbrelling a bunch of small producers. But there's definitely the incentive for them to appear small. If the government actually removes that incentive, maybe the industry will have less of a reason to, to keep that model around. So it's, it's worth thinking about. Yeah. How does the health harm of smoking BDs compare to the health harm of smoking cigarettes? And have we seen any substitution as a result of laws or other forces? So it's a good question. Um, there's no safe cigarette. That's my first thing is that, you know, all these things are both over any threshold of, of safe. Um, my understanding about BDs is that I think the nicotine is way higher in a single stick BD, but I don't know much about whether the consumption between smokeless, or excuse me, between BDs and cigarettes sort of compensates for that different level of nicotine. Um, you know, you're sort of getting me into a position where I say, yeah, like I believe BDs are worse cigarette, but there is no relative when you're dealing with cigarettes. So they're, they're all bad. I mean, you can imagine with smokeless as well, that's a sort of different 
health outcome in your body to some degree, you're much more worried about sort of, or not much more worried about, you're much more prevalent to get, or possible to get sort of oral, throat, you know, all those types of cancers, but both are gonna give you, I'm, I'm not even gonna make a relative statement on the, the impact, but yeah. Substitution? Um, was there substitution between the products? So, so ask that again really quick. Have you seen any change in use patterns as a result of taxes and regulation and other things? Like are we forcing people from cigarettes to BBs if we put more white label of cigarettes into people that are not compliant? No, I really don't think so. Um, I mean, the cigarettes are a pretty small component. I, I really do think that this is one country where the cigarette companies are kind of trying to catch up. You know, they, they have much less of the market than BDs and, and smokeless, um, so a little, a little bit behind. Um, and actually, they're taxed at much higher rates just because of the, the same exemptions that I, that I already talked about. Um, but no, I don't think we're seeing a lot of, of substitution. Sort of one thing that we are seeing, I mean, I think prevalence is doing a little bit better, and we, also, we are seeing population shift more towards urban areas um, and literacy rates going up in rural areas. So both of those things are good uh, movements towards sort of moving away from tobacco products. We certainly know that more education on these products is better for, for health outcomes. Similarly related, I guess, is um, if you have you know, what appears to be like these teeny tiny BD manufacturers, maybe overseen by you know, larger organizations, and then the cigarette market, which seem to be dominated by maybe one or a few companies, is there a potential for those cigarette companies to get into the BD market, particularly <laughs> if you know, that, that, the, the tax threshold changes or other regulations come down? That is assuming they're not already involved. I, I wouldn't be surprised if those cigarette companies were already partly involved in some of those. I don't want to say too much like conspiracy theory stuff, and I don't want to go out too far on a limb, but I wouldn't be surprised if the cigarette industry isn't already involved in any other industry that deals with tobacco or nicotine. Um, but yeah, I think like if you do remove those exemptions, it might be a little bit more forthcoming. You might actually be a little more more transparent. I doubt it. Transparency in the transparency in the tobacco industry don't really go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, did you see much of a difference in, when you were thinking about the states as countries, um, whether there was more of an a, an issue with illicit packs? in uh, different ones, like it, nearer the borders, for example, with China, or if the, you saw any patterns? I'll be able um, to answer that question probably in like the next like two days. <laughs> um, but I, I imagine, like I think two things sort of draw illicit when it's possible. A lot of it has to do with sort of poor governance. It's really, you know, about like sort of soft supply chain and stuff like that. But being near a border certainly helps, but that's not necessarily because being a state that has a big city where there's demand for an illicit product could also sort of make it be more apparent in those states. Um, but yeah, I, I, can, I can give you an answer on that. The only other tricky thing is with this data, like I said, I don't use the, I don't really come forth with the, uh, the illicit number that we find in this because we're going to a lot of, and not to say that, you know, very like uh, above board vendors don't do it, don't sell this it, but we are, you know, buying these packs in a, in a very sort of, we're not going to like a black market. We're not going looking for these packs. Um, so I, I'd be surprised if we find the illicit, even if it's present. I mean, for an example, I think when we bought in Russia and Brazil, it was like 0% illicit that we made. And we know there are illicit uh, markets in these countries. So this data collection is not perfectly uh, set up to, to talk about illicit, but if you find illicit doing this, then it it's a flag. And it, it, it worries me a little bit that you do need a study to look at like a, a, a sort of independent illicit number. A lot of what we get stuck with is the industry's illicit number and uh, tends to be a little bit higher or a little bit not even necessarily higher, it tends to be a little bit self-serving. 
Um, we've even seen evidence of the industry saying, oh, they elicit a very big problem. And, you know, every year they say this, but then you introduce a tax and then the industry goes back and revises their numbers to be like, actually, it wasn't high before it was low. We were wrong, but now it's increasing. So they have a lot of self-serving statements. So any independent numbers on illicit trade is, is great. Lisa. Knowing what you know about how BDs are produced, how what recommendations would you make for packaging these products to have them comply with the current health warning label laws? Um, both with, and I, I'll, I'll answer the BDs question. I'll probably answer the smokeless question as well, even though you didn't answer it or ask it. Um, I mean, the BDs, I think, should move away from the hand rolling of the BDs and the hand rolling of, of the actual packaging, too. Like, that's a very difficult. We actually did find one package that sort of came or one yeah pack of BDs that came in sort of the traditional um, cigarette packaging, right? Like the rectangular sort of cardboard little things. So we did actually find BDs in one of those as well. Like I would be fine also with the plastic sachets, little type of Ziploc thing that the BDs come in. Um, I mean, one thing that India has been very uh, aware of is that they don't want unbranded BDs as well, because you can imagine these BDs just being in like a clear Ziploc bag. That would be bad as well. It would be hard to track anything like that. Um, so moving towards sort of cardboard packaging like a cigarette or even something you know, more uniform that the health warning could be on a flat surface. Uh, it's not, I mean, I think movements towards that would also sort of move the industry away from hand rolling um, and hand sort of packaging. Uh, smokeless has a slightly different issue because a lot of them come in very affordable, tiny, single use little packets and a movement towards maybe selling them in larger quantities of tins that essentially could be reused, which has its own problems because then you have uh, somebody having access to a much larger sort of source of smokeless tobacco, but at least it would get at affordability too. I mean, having that single, that's why we see the cigarette industry move towards single sticks as well. Even though like the unit markup is even bigger for the consumer, it's way more affordable for someone to buy one stick than to buy a single pack. And it's the same thing, I think, with smokeless. We see a lot of very affordable single-use packets. Uh, so I would move towards something bigger as well. I mean, like some of these packets are so small that even if they're complying with 85%, it's still like you're like microphone, you know, micro, you're like looking at it, you're like, oh, I can't even see the health warning label. Steve. Uh, just following up a little bit on Lisa's point, are, are there any studies that you're aware of or any plans to take a look at what the impact of regulatory control on BDs is on the BD employment sector of the economy? I mean, there's a lot of push in India from the tobacco industry that you've got all these low-income uh, women and children out there rolling BDs, their only source of livelihood and all of yeah. that. So this is, I mean... A, I'm not, I'm not aware of any single study, but I do, I mean, this is where I'm getting information that this even exists, right? I know there are studies of, of seeing that, you know, X percentage of the labor force is women, right? There certainly is information and qualitative information as well about what that relationship is with someone higher up in the food chain, um, especially with the, the child labor as well. Like, I'd be shocked if like our human rights colleagues have not already been looking into this, but they do roll out like at the same time, they'll roll out obviously like child labor. You can't say much about that, but with the, the female labor, you can, they can roll out this argument that they're like empowering these women when that's not necessarily true. I mean, they're using the same argument for small tobacco farmers that, you know, they're helping them out. They're doing like, you know, a service for them that there is no alternative for these people, which is not necessarily and it's not realistically true that they, they a lot of them do have alternative means. So. Right. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. I mean, it was really interesting to get this big sense of the tobacco market in India, which is such a huge market, 
Um, and then complex with three really prevalent products and very different things going on, at least when it gets down to the, to the real tail level. So thank you so much for teaching us about all this. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Thanks.